From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. One of the ways many of us have been getting through the last few months is by taking comfort in the outdoors, in all that nature and the garden has to offer, by slowing down, looking around, and connecting. One person I know who does that as her 24-7, 365 life practice is today's guest, wildlife rehabilitator and artist and author, Julie Zekafus. In a minute, we'll talk about goings-on to have your eye on this fall, and also about getting ready for bird feeding season. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. I have to admit to being a fangirl of today's guest, Julie Zikafus, and when I need a lift lately, and who doesn't in this most challenging year of all, I often scroll through her Instagram to follow her latest wild bird rescue adventure or her unfolding meadow showing off yet another sequence of bloom and beauty, or frankly, sometimes just to enjoy the antics and videos and photos of the newest member of her family, a charismatic dog named Curtis, and their deepening bond. And I'm not even a dog person. So Julie's here today to help us all focus, to keep an eye on the outdoors, and also to get ready for bird feeding season. Hi, Julie. How are you? Hey, Margaret, I'm fine. I'm running around like a crazy squirrel. (laughs) Well, I'm your fangirl. I've just confessed. Oh, my Um, gosh. (laughs) Seriously, I just find sometimes, and I don't know if this is for you as well, but, you know, I wasn't a big social media person really personally so much, as much as for, you know, awaytogarden.com and whatever. But I have found sometimes there's certain people who I feel relaxed when I look through what they're doing and where they are and your pictures relax me (laughs) oh that's the intent and you know I think probably I'm posting to relax myself (laughs) and uh you know I I tend to do it when I have a moment to reflect and just kind of you know draw a little meaning out of what I'm seeing and um I I'm I'm uh, aggressively apolitical because I will not survive if I become political yes yeah yes 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 we're going to stick to to ecology and garden and plants and birds and bugs and stuff like that. So no politics. Um, So before we get started, I wanted to say, I thought I'd do a giveaway with a transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com of Saving Jemima, which was your most recent book. And we talked about it when it came out, I believe. Um, I mean, I, I believe it was your most recent your story of this hard luck Jay, the blue Jay that you rehabbed. And anyway, I love that book. It also relaxed me and gave me escape. So I want to do a giveaway with that, with the transcript. Lovely. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 So I called you up because I want your expert advice on how to slow down and look around, like kind of where to begin, because you really seem to have a practice of connecting to nature. So tell us a little bit about you in that. <laughs> well, it really, really helps to have a dog with a bladder that has to be let out every morning. <laughs> because, And I think a lot of us know this. Uh, the dog brings out our inner child. It, 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 it forces us to go, oh, well, I'll just take a long walk with the dog. And that's a wonderful excuse to get out each and every morning, you know, without fail, because this is an imperative. And so I turn that into a morning meditation that can sometimes go four hours or more. And, you know, that sounds like a a sort of a rich Victorian lady way to live. I assure you I'm anything but that. But I don't have an office that I have to go to. My, My orchard and meadow is my office. And once I realized that, my life took a decided turn toward the wonderful. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I realized that, that observing things and sharing what I see is really my job. I'm one of those people out there who needs to do this and share. So um, tell us where you are. I am in southeast Ohio in the Appalachian foothill, foothills of Ohio, right. about uh, 20 miles northeast of Marietta in the okay. extreme southeast corner of the state. 
And uh, so this is a very rolling, um, heavily wooded, highly diverse area. Uh, It's much more akin geographically to West Virginia than it is to what most people think of as flat plains, cornfield, Ohio. Okay. Um, So here we are. And when this is airing, it's October and um and we've been th- we will have been through most of the migration um let's just talk about the recent migration or the ongoing migration who's been visiting what have you been able to say hello to along the way this year? oh it's been it's been so incredible it was very late uh yeah. early september came and went without a bird and i was worried i didn't have my normal pulse of um, juvenile birds coming through in mid-july and I thought, uh oh, and then, um, you know, mid to late September, third week of September came around and oh my goodness, it's like the floodgates opened. So I was vastly reassured that the birds had managed despite the incredibly cruel spring uh, of very, very low temperatures in late May. Um, birds had managed to pull off some young, but they did it later than they normally do. So these birds were not ready to fly until probably just about now. So they're pouring through, and um, I think the the main stars this year for me have been the bay-breasted warblers who are everywhere, uh, black pole warblers as well. I get um, lots of Tennessees, as many people do. I sometimes think Tennessee warbler must be one of the most abundant birds on the planet. Uh, if you go down to Costa Rica, you see them in the coffee plantations. You see them in Guatemala on the mountaintops. They're just all over the place. Um, uh, magnolia warblers, chestnut-sided warblers. It's just been so beautiful. Um, I will say that vireos are diverse. Uh, we've had uh, blue-headed, red-eyed, white-eyed, and Philadelphia here. So oh. that's always a thrill. Oddly, I get Philadelphia vireos, but not warbling vireos. And I only get Philadelphia vireos in the fall. I've had one spring record in 28 years. Um, the same is true of Cape May warblers, who are among our most common migrants. I get gobs of them in the fall. They're just, you know, I never use the word trash bird, but some birders do. Um, I've got gobs of, of uh, Cape May warblers, but I get very few in the spring. So mm-hmm. that tells me that migration routes differ by season and right. probably by sex of the bird. And uh, it's, it's just, it's also complex and fascinating and keeping notes is the whole point. Well, and that's what you just said. You said record. You, you referred to yes. a record. Yes. And and I I uh, my neighbor up the hill. Uh, she loves birds as well. And she texted me. I don't know a week or two ago, or maybe it was mid September, let's say. And she said, "Oh, I still have a lot of you know humming hummingbirds. We get just the ruby throated and uh, mm-hmm. in the Northeast here. And and um, and she said, you know." I don't usually get them after this week. I wonder if they'll still be here next week. And so she keeps records, right? Bless and I her. quickly, yes. right. And so I quickly went to my ebird.org, my Cornell Lab of Ornithology database, you know, mm-hmm. my member account there and checked. And I was like, and I texted her right back and I said, October 4th, 2016 was the latest sighting of a hummingbird I ever had here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Ooh. And I, yeah. hello. <laughs> and I just, that's, it comforts me. Yes. You know? Yes. Continuity, yes. right? Yes. Tying yourself into the phenology of the season, being aware of what's normal and what's expected in a certain week is such a beautiful thing. And it's the old way. It's how people lived. You know, oh, well, it's about time for the bee birds to come back in. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it, but but we've gotten away from that. But But it's right within everyone's reach to just write it down on your computer, on your phone, in eBird, on paper, like I do. Um, Write it down and then have something you can comb through and see, you know, what your records look like. It's it's a great, great thing to do and it ties you right in. And then the the, the, the nice segue you get there is journaling. If you're going to write down the dates, you see something, write about them. And, and writing helps you process everything you see and everything you experience. And then you have a record. Yeah. I mean, the, you were speaking about all the diversity of warblers that you see. And, and if I actually ever left the house or garden and went anywhere, I probably would see even more. So Mm -hmm. I mostly do my birding from right near the house, you know, right on my my garden. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, um, uh, so the black throated blue warblers, 
I, I, I have always had them, but I don't normally see them in season. I only see them during the migration. Sure. And, and, um, uh, and this year I saw a female and, oh, and, beautiful. you know, and, and the female warblers are kind of hard, sometimes hard, at least for me to tell apart from whatever I, I you know, sometimes sure. they look so different. Well, they always look so different from the male mm-hmm. and, and, and there was this little, I saw this bird feeding on some Aurelia racemosa, the spikenard, <sighs> the native perennial spikenard. And, yes. and I saw this bird, you know, in there and I looked with my binoculars and I, I, and, and I saw this little white spot, this little mm-hmm. white spot on the midwing kind of. And, and I, I went to my book and I was so excited, was like, white spot, white spot. And sure enough, you know, yeah. and I'd seen yeah. the male a million times. And sure. I, what, the other thing I love is, the behavior, getting to know, not just I saw this bird, check, you know, but this is a bird that you'll see it gleaning like along the branches in trees, you know, deciduous trees, like I'll mm-hmm. see them, they're like going quickly a- around the branches and looking for goodies, you know, and mm-hmm. other birds don't behave exactly the same way. And I love watching for the behavior too. You know? Well, and you you also mentioned Aurelia racemosa as a, mm-hmm. as a, Plant. Well, I used to, when I lived in Connecticut, I used to haunt an, a huge Hercules club, which is Aurelia spinosa. Which I have and, a whole grove of, yes. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh. Well, that was <laughs> always where the black-throated blues came. Yes. And how cool that you've got a warbler that seems to specialize, at least during fall migration, on Aurelia species. Yes, it's interesting. And of course, usually who I see in the both herbaceous and woody Aurelia that you just mentioned um, are various thrushes and yes. so for the Swainsons yes. comes yes. only at this time of year, you know, mm-hmm. only at this time of year and mm-hmm. um, for me. And, and so it's just interesting to, but a lot of different thrushes come and enjoy those fruits. So, but the, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. Aurelia spinosa is a thrush of Palooza and um, <laughs> we're having that right now. I'm holding a thrush of Palooza in my orchard. Uh, I've got a uh, hermit or the uh, hermit, has only just arrived, but Swainson's, we've just been overwhelmed with them and uh, wood. And uh, I have heard, and finally, I, I made the gray cheeked thrush my um, whooping crane this fall. There's a beautiful Lyle Lovett song about his looking for a whooping crane and not being able to find one. Well, I kept hearing the gray cheeked thrush going, Queer! which is its unique little call. And uh-huh. uh, I finally saw one utter the queer. <laughs> and got and got a definitive idea. Of course, I couldn't get a picture. The thrushes are just about impossible. Um, but that same day, I came in from birding, and I sat down at my drawing table, and a Swainson's thrush plopped itself into my bird <gasps> bath and took a soaking bath. <laughs> so I got oh fabulous goodness. photos of that. Yeah, and that was only the second Swainson's thrush I've had bathe in the bath. The last one was uh, in September 2004. Not that anyone keeps records of these. Not things. that anyone here is keeping records or is being a nerd about it, but you know, <laughs> I'm being a total nerd about it. I've got a bath list for my bath, and I think it's at somewhere around 79 species of birds have bathed in my bird bath. Oh, so <laughs> so not that we're trying to just list birds out loud, audience listening or reading the transcript, but what we're trying to say is this is what keeps us going. This right. is this is our connection. Both of us, right. here we are, two people, half a country apart from each other. Yeah. And for years and years and years, this has kept us going. So it's a practice yes. we both recommend, yes, as life sustaining. Can I can I also introduce another practice that I see lots of people engaging in and that I have I have done over the years. Um, Monarch uh, caterpillars mm. are such incredibly fascinating creatures to observe. And finally, there were enough this year such that I was able to establish a little monarch ranch in my front yard. I like to, I don't say that I raise them. That seems rather arrogant. So I like to observe them outside. I think they should grow up outside in the free air and open wind and I think it prevents a lot of disease. So I watched them on the Asclepius. I was growing in pots on my front porch. And I managed to take in uh, 10 caterpillars, uh, Mm. caught them as they went on walkabout to do their pupation. And I got immersed in making time-lapse videos of them forming chrysalides and then emerging from the chrysalis. Mm. And I, it is so addictive. It's just, 
it's so amazing. Um, I, I just, I made videos in real time and I made them in, in most of them in time lapse using an iPhone. Right. Uh, and we'll yeah, give links to those both on you. You had some of them, I think on Instagram, didn't you? Or, and yes, on the my Instagram feed has, has some, yeah. um, yeah. yeah, I have yet to unleash what I've been doing because I've got a lot of editing to do. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that I, I got kind of sucked down a whirlpool and I realized I had something very, very special. So being there for their emergence has been my goal. And again, it's, it's like the art of tea, you know, it's like you begin to notice incredibly subtle things about their behavior that tell you when they're about to go through a life change. And you also then become a, a you know, hawk like intent, you, you focus on the chrysalis and you notice the tiny changes in it that tells you the butterfly is about to emerge. Mm. And uh, it's just so cool. So yesterday I had to go out at noon. I had to leave the house, drop dead date noon. It's because I had to be an hour and a half away uh, at, at two. Uh, so, so I had this pair of chrysalides and they were just about to close. And I prayed oh. to whatever gods I have that they had closed in time for me to make videos. And they did. Um, so it was just, it was just way, way, way cool. And I just released the last one this morning. Oh, um, I've, I've, I have told you an email, but I'll say it out loud here. Um, and I also this year, besides getting a new pair of binoculars um, during pan the beginning of the pandemic, um, I, I also got some trail cameras and, and got Ooh. some help from a local yeah. expert in setting them up, learning, understanding how to set them up and what I was uh, looking for and so forth. And, right. um, and that's been another uh, way of engage, engaging and uh, especially with the nightlife it's oh, yes. who's out at night hysterical yeah. pictures of yes not one set but like four sets of eyeballs in the in the dark you know mm -hmm. infrared like glowing in the dark and it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know and, and literally laugh out loud moments where I, yes. I have lots of fun with trail cams like um coyotes approaching skunks and skunks then raising the tail and backing up at the coyote <laughs> you're just like oh i know what's going on in this picture uh yeah just laugh out loud moments or when the deer comes up to lick the camera you know it's just so fabulous and i i feel like that's something where it's not a million dollars to get involved in it and, yeah. and and it's something where um it's great with children i would imagine would be very engaging with children for the family to look forward a couple you know once a week or whatever to the downloads and um the teaching that can come with it and so you know i, I feel like that's like a sort of looking ahead to the holidays like that would be an amazing family gift you know is to have yes in, in, invite a trail camera into your into your world and again it doesn't have to be the million dollar ones you know it can start simple yeah and and here's here's the cool thing i fought the increasing tech on these things for a long yes. time and um i now have one from moultrie mobile which is a subscription based thing right and this crazy thing sends me an alert when something walks by the game cam and i get it on my phone and if you want something addictive just have your phone say, oh, there's something walking by game cam number one. Uh-oh. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh -oh. um, quite often it's a leaf falling uh, or a yes, blue yes, coming yes. down for an acorn, something like that. But sometimes it's a bobcat. And then it's like, oh, my God, right now in my meadow is a coyote walking right there. Yeah. And isn't that cool to know? Yeah. No, yeah. It's so, so that's just another thing. And I, and I definitely want to take – a number of minutes here, you know, because I know it'll happen is we'll start talking warblers again and run out of time. But <laughs> right, right, right. I, I want it. You know, one of the things that's coming up is quote bird feeder season. I can't feed because, as we've talked about before, because I have black bear who <sighs> love to come to the house, and and so I don't feed from sometime in March until Thanksgiving or around there. But got it. But, but uh, when uh, the peak feeder feeder season, whether you have black bear or you don't have black bear, is off in the winter. You know, that's what a lot of people are thinking about. And I just wanted to ask you, kind of looking ahead to that, you feed and at certain times of year, and you know, what's best practices like, and 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 how do we engage more with that? Like, not just put the feeder out there, but make that part of our life, really. Well, since, since you and I've been corresponding, I've been thinking a lot about the whole black bear issue. And that's an animal that 
you know, people are often surprised to hear me say, I do not want black bears. I never <laughs> want to see a black bear in my yard. Thank you very much. I've got coons. That's plenty. Um, but yeah, I really, really empathize with you on that, that possibility of having everything destroyed in the swipe of a paw um, because, because these things live in your area. Yeah, uh, I we we are not yet cursed with black bears in in southeast Ohio, but I I, I know they're coming, and yeah. I have to think though that this is better for birds to not feed when it's warm. I at, from a disease standpoint, as a wildlife yeah. rehabilitator, I've seen so much disease in summer feeding, and I stopped feeding in mid July this year. I kind of took a step back and I said, Julie, what are you doing? Because I had house finches coming, they, they came and nested in the yard and it was all adorable and wonderful and I could look into the nest and see them. Well, then they raised nine young and five of those came down with Mycoplasma gallinae, which is the uh, Galliceptacum, which is the stupid house finch disease that chickens carry, yes. that got into the eastern house finch population and proliferated because these birds are genetically inbred, they're depressed, genetically depressed, they have no resistance to it, and they catch it. So right. then they go about and transmit it to as at least 30 other species of wild birds, including my beloved blue jays. So I looked at these sick birds huddled on my feeder huddled in my bird bath, pooping into the water. And I said, Julie, what are you doing? This is the most selfish thing you could possibly do. I pulled down all the feeders, I bleached them, and I put them away until today. And that was really difficult for me because these are my friends. These are my neighbors, these birds, especially the blue yeah. jays. And it was so hard to have them come by the studio window and actually beg from me and say, y y y you haven't put it out today. What's going on? You know, And I'd have to look them in the eye and i say, it's for your own good. Go get a caterpillar. Goodbye. And uh, mm -hmm. so I think bears are sort of forcing the pendulum, at least in the Northeast and, and down the Appalachian chain, to swing back toward what makes sense, which right. is to feed the birds when they actually might need it. To when supplement in winter, right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. To supplement in winter. That's what feeding ought to be. And I think a lot of us have completely lost sight of that. And people are feeding their birds live mealworms all summer long. They right. don't need that. No. That's not good for them. And and it's it causes overproduction in bluebirds. And people get convinced that they are the center of the bird's universe. And the birds are only too happy to reinforce that foolish notion. <laughs> So in the last couple, two, three minutes, the, when what? we do feed, yes, I know we're always out of time. We're always out of time. That's, it should be called the way to garden out of time dot com. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, but so when we get to the point where we're, it's re we're ready to feed for me, that's like, again, Thanksgiving ish. Um, I, I have a thing against this, those mixes, the cheap bagged mixes, you know, they're mostly millet, proso millet or whatever. Anyway, sure. You know, I just like to feed something that's super high value. So, and I, I'm going to give the recipe for your Zicto, the link to your recipe, because you make this wonderful concoction yes. also. And we talked about it the last time, but mm -hmm. what, what seeds do you feed? My, my favorite staple is the peanut half. And these are uh -huh. rejects from the candy industry. They're pretty hard to find at an affordable price, but I buy them by the 50 pound bag at my beloved White's Mill in Athens, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just brought 50 pounds home yesterday. I roast them myself because I think it's probably more digestible and I like the smell mm -hmm. of roasting peanuts and it gives me something nerdy to do. Um, the other staple is the sunflower chip. The little That's what I heart. use, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's no yeah. waste. You aren't poisoning your lawn with hulls. You aren't gonna get the, the um, flower moths in them quite as badly without knowing they're in, the, you know what I mean? Like you have yes. a whole thing of black oil sunflower and they all have holes drilled in them. So they yes. aren't even edible, but you can't even tell. Um, so those are my two staples. And then I, I do put out black oil sunflower with shells and I put out Niger um, for the goldfinches and the siskins. Right. But, but the two are the sunflower chips and the peanuts because there's no waste and they don't wreck my lawn under, not, not that I have a beautiful lawn, but they don't wreck it. And water year round do you have? Uh, you yes, like I have water yeah. year round. I, I have, I take the bird spa down uh, the bubbling bird spa, and then I, I put out a heated pet dish, which is very right. cheap 
and right. I, f- I put a couple of bricks in it and a nice flat rock so the birds can't bathe in it. They can only drink from it. And the, the big rock also keeps them from pooping in it quite so much. Yeah. So, so I have that going all winter and that's been wonderful. You get flickers and thrushes and tanagers and stuff like that. It's very cool. Well, Julie, we are going to have to have another date to do this because I can just tell there's like a million other things we need to talk <laughs> about, but I'm so happy to hear your voice and it's just, it's cheered me up. So thank you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh, Margaret, time. anytime, anytime. Okay. And your voice cheers me too. Thank okay. you for doing what you do. All right. And we'll introduce people through a link to your Instagram to meet Curtis. Mr. Mm, Curtis. Uh-huh. Curtis no. Okay. All okay. right. Talk to you All soon. Right. Bye-bye. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. Brushwoodnursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. And I hope I'll talk to all the rest of you again soon. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy ecologically minded garden cleanup meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.